this is video three, which is on stopping distances. Um, once again, working on momentum, impulse, collisions as the topic here. So there are two dependents, two variables, that are dependent upon the impulse momentum theorem. Those two dependents are your stopping times and distances. Okay, think about this. If truck A has twice the momentum of truck B, okay, so momentum is two times greater than truck B for truck A, what do you know about the stopping distance? Contemplate that for a second. Think about what you've learned so far in these past two videos about momentum. If one object has twice the momentum as another object, then what do you know about the stopping distance of this object that has twice the momentum? Time, right? Okay, so you're thinking about the impulse momentum theorem. Delta P equals F times delta T. F is constant, we'll just say in the scenario, because once again, something has to be constant. One variable, more specifically, has to be constant. Therefore, your time, delta T, and your momentum, delta P, um, are going to be directly related to each other. So the more momentum you have, the more time it'll take you to stop here. So more specifically, truck A will take, how long? Truck A will take twice as long. truck B to stop. So what's the relationship between momentum and time? Well, you got to think about what is constant, right? You can't just ask what two variables in the relationship. Something has to be constant between them. And this constant factor would be the amount of force that's applied to each object in the system. Um, so the equation that I would like you to think about is your impulse momentum theorem equation, which is delta P equals F times delta T. Once again, F is your constant, so therefore, as one goes up, the other one goes up. As one goes down, the other variable goes down. There's a direct relationship between those two variables, as long as force is held constant in the impulse momentum theorem. Okay, next thing that we have here is our sample problem that deals with stopping distances. So with this, it says a 2240 kilogram car traveling towards the west slows down uniformly. Okay, so your first one is your mass, 2240 kilograms from... So that would be an initial velocity, but guys, how's it heading? It's heading westward. So since it's heading westward, that's going to be a negative 20.0 meters per second to a final velocity of negative 5.00 meters per second. Um, how long does it take this car to decelerate, slow down, at the force on the car, F? equals 8410 newtons, we don't like that. Us IV students like to use our standard units and not derived units. So what is newtons? Newtons is really kilograms times meters per second squared. Time out, how did you know that guys? How do we know that force is kilograms times meters per second squared? Well, because our original equation is F net equals M A net whereas mass is in kilograms and acceleration is meters per second squared. So therefore, a newton is equivalent to a kilogram times a meters per second squared. So use the standard not derived, please. Okay. Um, how far does the car, <coughs> excuse me, travel during this deceleration? So you have two unknowns here. How long is delta T? What units do you want to put delta T in? What are the standard units? You can't just choose, oh, I'll put it in hours today. You gotta go off of the units that are on your givens. So check out your givens for a second. Do you see any time units there? Yeah, you do, like your velocities and your force, they all have seconds. Great guys, they all have seconds written into them. So you want a second for your time. Okay, the second one says how far, how far would be delta X, right? Check out your variables again. Do you want kilometers? Do you want decimeters? Do you want millimeters? You want meters. 
So that one should be solved for in M. All right, the original equation. What is the original equation that takes this into consideration? Well, to talk about your uh, amount of force, your time, your velocities, your mass, you're going to be talking about your impulse momentum theorem, which is delta P equals F times delta T. From that, you don't know what delta P is, but you know that it breaks down into M V F minus M V I. Like, okay, <laughs> let's get really technical here. Delta P means what? What does delta mean, guys? Delta means the change in, correct? So if you're doing uh, initial and final, correct? So technically, delta P equals PF minus PI. So right here, we have PF minus PI equals F times delta T, which is MVF minus MVI equals F times delta T. Well, M is common between these two variables, so I'm just going to simply factor it out and get this equation. On this line right here, focus on this line, please. On this line right here, are you seeing all of your givens and unknowns? Well, clearly there's only one that we're solving for at a time, the specific unknown, um, represented in this line that has the red arrow by it, or do we need to break it down yet one more step? No, we do not need to break it down anymore. But what we do need to do is rearrange it so we can isolate the variable that we're trying to solve for. Well, which unknown are you trying to solve for? Are you trying to solve for delta x, or are you trying to solve for delta t with this impulse momentum theorem? Yeah, yeah, delta t. So what do you got to do to the f, guys? Got to divide it on both sides. So that would be m quantity vf minus vi divided by f equals delta t. Therefore, your m is 2240. Your vf is a negative 5.00 minus a negative 20.0. All of that is divided by a force of 8410. Get your calculators out, please. Okay? So <clears throat> negative 5 and 2 negatives gives you a positive there. Negative 5 and a positive 20, okay? Think about these little shortcuts. Don't be robotic in the fact that you're just throwing it into your calculator, okay? Think about this stuff a little bit. Find those shortcuts. See if you can factor things out, reduce variables, cancel things out, move variables around. Okay, so... You have 2240 times the quantity of negative 5 minus, start your parentheses, negative 20, end your parentheses, divided by 8410. Calculator answer should be 3.99. Okay, so if your calculator answer is 3.99, um, let's go over here real quick. So we have three sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs. You have three figs. Ugh. Three sig figs written here. So your final answer is 3.99. I'm just due to space, obviously. I'm going to write this right here. Delta T equals 3.99 seconds. Box it and let's solve for the second half, which I'm going to just insert another page into your notes here, guys. Okay, so this is the second half. So now we want to figure out our delta X. Check out what you know. You have a, a delta x that you're trying to solve for, an initial velocity, a final velocity, a uh, mass, a force, a time. You've got to think of a kinematic equation that is most appropriate for this scenario. There is not a kinematic equation that has force in it. So clearly we don't want to try to apply force into this problem. So force is kicked out of this equation. Do you have a kinematic equation Back when we were talking about 1D and 2D motion equations, do you have a kinematic equation that is dealing with mass? No. Mass is not listed in any of your kinematic equations. So you need to find a kinematic equation that has delta X, VF, VI, and delta T in it. That kinematic equation, you don't need to rewrite your givens again because you're using the same givens, right? So you're going to start at the ESS portion here. So that would be delta X equals one-half VI plus VF times delta t. You do not need to rearrange it because the variable that you're trying to solve for is already isolated. vi is a negative 20.0 plus a negative 5.00 times, what's the time you just solved for? 3.99. Alright, plug that into your calculator please. Plugging that into your calculator What are you seeing that you're getting for your final answer? All right, 49.0.
going to eight, seven, five. How many sig figs did you want? Check this out again. Three sig figs. So what's the seven do to the eight? The seven rounds it up. Therefore, your delta x equals 49.9 .9 meters. Okay, Miss Art agreed this one. Box it. On to the next one. Okay, so lastly here, just thinking about this. Here is um, a picture showing you the difference between a, well, not the difference, kind of, yes, the difference, but it's more so showing you the application, not a very safe application, but in application, of the impulse momentum theorem in action. So what these uh, children are doing is they are playing a game where they take this mat and they pull it crazy tight. Well, if you pull this mat crazy tight, you're increasing the amount of force, right? Bounce. So in essence, what they are doing is their hands are acting like springs on a trampoline, and that mat is like the mesh of the trampoline. A kid gets on there and they start bouncing up and down. Okay, so now the analogy in your guys' life is, and I'm sure a majority of you have, jumped on a trampoline at one point in time so far in your lives. So the, the tighter the springs are, the more bounce, i.e. higher height, you would be able to achieve. You with me? Okay, so with that, what are we talking about here? We're trying to talk about the relationship between force and time. So what I want you to think about is this statement, okay? It's not written on here. Just think about this for a second, please. Force is reduced when the time interval of impact is fill in the blank. Force is reduced when the time interval of the impact is blank. Okay, so you're saying, uh, Miss Arter, you need to tell us what's being held constant, right? Because I'm asking you to assess force and time, right? Well, it's the momentum that is staying constant. It's your P, your momentum that is staying constant. So if you know that momentum staying constant, you should be thinking about the impulse momentum theorem, hence the title of this slide. So therefore, once again now, think about your relationship. So I'm going to jot this up here, guys. It says delta P equals F times delta T. If your momentum is staying constant, what is the relationship between force and time? It's an indirect relationship, right? As one increases, the other one decreases. So here's your statement one more time. Force is reduced when the time interval of impact is increased. Increased should be your word there. So this is the second thing that I want you to think about. You, you've already mentioned this in a previous video, but just once again, thinking about this picture, thinking about you jumping on a trampoline. A large force exerted over a short time. What are you going to do? What happens to you? You got that large force, that bam, that impact, right? Short amount of time, really little amount of time. You're driving your car, you slam on your brakes, short amount of time, right? Okay, so a large force exerted over a short time causes the same change in momentum as a small force exerted over a longer amount of time. Okay, so memory foam, right? Isn't this making sense? Do you want a bet that has like crazy hard springs in there? Do you want one of those memory foam ones that's going to just contour to your body? Well, why is it doing that? You're not applying so much force to this system. So it's going to take a longer amount of time for it to quote unquote flatten out again. Whereas really, really stiff springs would take a shorter amount of time, like kind of practically constantly, it would be in that same position. There's so many real life applications of the impulse momentum theorem. All right, so that kind of ends this video here. So um, after watching this video, please make sure that once again, you're making comments on each of the slides. If you have any questions to ask during class, um, happy to help you with that. Um, but also please complete the stopping distance problems uh, worksheet that accompanies this video now. Okay, so stopping distances is what's accompanying this video. Awesome job, guys.